Welcome to the Dealing with Goliath podcast. The mission of Dealing with Goliath is to sharpen the psychological edge in negotiation, ethical influencing, and high impact conversations for business leaders who want to be more effective under pressure, uncover hidden value, and build greater connection, all while increasing profitability. This is the short form espresso shot of inside podcast interview to boost business performance using our five questions in around about 15 to 20 minutes format. My guest today is Marcus Kauke. Marcus has 35 years of failure, scar tissue and bad decisions in sales, in management and in business under his belt. He served across over 500 market segments. He can be found running a series of usually non-fatal experiments. <laughs> can ask about those in a minute. Deliberately finding ways to do more with less, to remove unhelpful friction, to help free up time for higher value activities. He asks challenging questions that make you reassess your status quo, that help you find a better path to your intended outcomes. He is the co-author of Making Channel Sales Work, He's married with three daughters, is a prolific LinkedIn content producer, the founder of Sales, A Force for Good, a podcaster, the Inquisitor podcast, and he is the founder of Sales for Good and the Red Ecosystem. So it's kind of a mouthful there, Marcus. So just let's help people understand. So who's your ideal client and what's the biggest challenge that they tend to face? Right. Um, my core business, how I make my living is by coaching really ambitious AEs who have a set of values that are currently being challenged because they're being stretched and tested to uh, try and meet short-term objectives. And they know that's not the right thing. And they consider that their reputation, their word is too precious to squander. And they're looking for a way to navigate that path and uh, find a balance between turning the ship and creating a certain predictable pipeline that is built up of only the ideal customer and um, not wasting their time on low value activity. So I'm a big fan of the old Chinese doctor's way of getting paid, which is you paid them a lot of money when you were healthy and they had to cover your costs and all of your medicine and treatment when you were sick. It's now, a fascinating paradigm, yeah. Isn't it just? So imagine if pharma pharmaceutical companies were compensated in that way. Um, so what I tend to do is I ask questions that cause you to see the world through a different lens. And in doing that, you get better answers and you accelerate the sale because you're not creating needless friction. You're getting to what the customer actually cares about because it's not about you, your product, your company, um, your valuation target, or anything else. It's about facilitating the customer to make the best possible decision for themselves for now and the future, whether it involves you or not. And therein lies the rub, because you have to have courage and you have to be vulnerable enough to know that you might get hurt in the process. And Absolutely. that's not always for everyone. It's not always for everyone. And as you said, right from the start there, you're talking about people who have a strong sense of their values as a key differentiator. I mean, that must polarize an awful lot of salespeople right there. But on top of that, as you said, you wanted to, to maneuver them toward, as you said, being braver, toward ac accepting and encouraging their courage. So what are some of the common mistakes people make when they're trying to to make that shift, they're not feeling they're in an optimum state. They're not where they want to be. There's something off. But as you said, there's this huge gulf, this challenge, maybe no man's land, scary stuff. So what are some of the mistakes maybe they make before they find you? Fabulous question. OK, so first thing, haste. Haste is the killer of mm. speed. You've got to slow down to speed up. Um, and the second thing, and you mentioned it in your uh, conversation with Scotty, is reflection. No one does any bloody reflection. You need to spend a minimum of an hour a week, and I would be recommending 45 minutes to an hour a day, uh, in thought. Um, the most successful salespeople I know who are not transaction monkeys and are uh, just basically starting afresh every month 
um, are the ones who've really given thought to think as their customer. They've given thought to the journey that the customer is going on. And that journey might start three or four years before you ever touch them. Because there are niggling doubts and frustrations that occur. If you imagine it's like um, a night bombing raid. And right. the business landscape is just a bunch of little explosions and pops that you can see from the ground, uh, see, see from the air on the ground. Now, when you're on the ground, they're very present and very dangerous. But you don't get to see the bigger picture. Now, our job as salespeople is to be able to macro or meta out to see the context in which our customers operate and our competitive landscape, and then macro down into the bigger picture that the uh, leadership are trying to deal with. What is the job they are trying to accomplish? And almost no salespeople bother to think in this way. Um, largely out of ignorance, they don't know better. But mm. when they do, it's hard work. And it requires deep thought. And it requires you actually going out and trying to prove you are wrong. You know, critical thinking. They, people don't do this enough. Now, when you do, what it does, it starts to build frameworks. And now we have AI. You can start building those into prompts so that you can actually inform and prepare yourself in a way that you never could before. Now, this is the kind of stuff that gets me terribly excited because um, creating this human AI technology partnership that is very customer centric, that creates a win-win-win outcome. It's a win for you, it's a win for the customer, and it's a win for your partners. Because the other thing that I'm very clear about, especially with people selling technology, which is a lot of my clients, um, is that technology has become so complicated and so sophisticated. Um, and as a result, it should just be complex and sophisticated, but they've made it complicated and sophisticated. So I know mm. sales organizations where salespeople waste two and a half hours a day navigating their own technology just to get the information they need to do their job. Yeah, um, And I know one organization that's resorted to uh, feeding all of that data into one Excel spreadsheet and they've now recovered 50 times two and a half hours of prospecting time per day. So that's 125 hours per day, 625 hours per week. Can you imagine the effect that has? That's insane. Exactly. So this is the third mistake people make, is they look at the problem from the wrong end of it. Mm -hmm. They start looking from where they are, and then they take step by step by step what they should work out. And there are three things that I would urge everyone to investigate. One is jobs to be done. What is the job to be done that the business or everyone in the business is um, committed to? Now, do they understand what their role is in executing their part of that job? Now, in many organizations, people don't understand what the job to be done is. So they're all working at cross purposes and thinking they're doing a great job, which means that you're creating inherent waste. Remember the Chinese doctor? Mm -hmm. Well, I think leaders and directors should be compensated on how effective they make the organization, not on uh, the illusion of efficiency, which is the big sacrifice that we seem to have made. There's, there's an awful lot to unpick there, Marcus. There's right. an awful lot. That's quite all right. That's quite all right. Uh, you know, because as you said, you I mean, we'll go jump back to the start where you talked about reflection seems to be one of the key, for want of a better word, force multipliers it, it, in a positive and negative way because it's not, it, it gets people. This is the first thing I say to most clients, whatever stage they are in their career, is even 15 minutes after lunch on a Friday. Start with that, and then uh, we build it up to an hour, as you say, a week. But it's the exact same thing, because you get to see your own patterns of mistakes. Yeah. Then people like me or you come in to tell them all their blind spots and mistakes there, well, but that, they can that, start that, with their own. Well, that, that's the other mistake they make. They try and do it themselves. Ask mm -hmm. for help. There are lots mm -hmm. of people out there. One, one of my favorite bits of advice to my uh, clients is um, go out and find people whose history is your future. And then contact them and say, Al, cheeky ask, would you be my mentor? 
20 minutes a month, I will bring you the shittiest, gnarliest problem that I can't break the back of, and I'll tell you the three things that I've tried to fix them. Anytime I fail to do this, you can fire me. What do you say? And you do that with 12 people, five will probably say yes. Now you've got a brain trust, and these people can save you the effort of making those mistakes. You can make different ones. Exactly. You make, uh, it, what does it say? Uh, I usually say upgrade the problem. You know, yeah. let's let's just keep upgrading that next challenge, that next problem. Absolutely. This, this, is, a, this is a really great exercise. Mm. Look at the jobs that you do. What are the $10 jobs, the $100 jobs, the $1,000 jobs, and the $10,000 an hour jobs? Absolutely. Which ones are you doing and who should be doing them? What are you doing to delegate those and how are you empowering them to make good decisions? Exactly. And this comes back to your roles. Because the business needs roles to deliver the service or product that they're being yeah. paid for, as you say. But are people clear on the roles? Are even the bosses clear on the roles? Half the time, not. There's going to be dis disagreement. I mean, one of the one of the great things to do, as I said, is get you write your staff's role, have them do it as well, and then compare your notes, and you'll see that there's often not an awful my, lot of overlap. My pal Antonio Garrido has an, an awesome exercise for this. Mm. Um. First day, the chairman invited him in as CEO, the new CEO, right. and said, Antonio, what I'd like you to do, and he slid across his very expensive Mont Blanc pen and a blank sheet of paper, write down all the qualities that will make you successful in this role. So he wrote all those down, and he passed them across, and his chairman looked at them. Mm, you can do better. And he slid it across. And the same rigmarole happened another time. And on the third occasion, okay, well, that'll do. That's now your job description. And I want you to carry that piece of paper around with you. And at any point, I can ask you to take that piece of paper out and show me what you've done in the last week to work on one of those areas to improve or get better. Now, I've uh, adapted this because I'm meaner than Antonio's uh, chairman, which is, Flip it over on the other side. What are the characteristics of, so let's say, a CEO that will cause them to fail? What mm -hmm. are the characteristics that are, uh, what are the values, the red flags? Mm -hmm. Okay, because one of the things that I urge my clients to do is develop an anti-ICP. Right. It's not good enough to just have an ICP, which most people have no idea how to do either, um, but that's crucial. But then you need to know who the anti-ICP, because your total addressable market is not your future customer base. A tiny proportion of them will be. And it's your job to try and sift those out and nurture those relationships for as long as humanly possible in advance, whilst they are in either, they don't know that they're gonna need help, yeah. they're in passive looking, and when they move from passive to active looking, you really want to have connections with all the key stakeholders, the people who are going to suffer the outcome of whatever decision leadership makes, the people who are going to spend the money, the people who are going to evaluate, the people who are going to have to live with and maintain, um, the people who are going to renew, the people who are going to ultimately sign off and authorize. You can't do the drive-by shooting anymore. Um, it's not a numbers game. I was just on a call um, with uh, Vlad, uh, Vlad Blagdojevic. Sorry, Vlad, Vlad I'm so sorry. Um, and uh, his process is just so beautiful. You know, instead of 200 accounts, it's 11. And they end up um, getting uh, three out of the nine that they engage as clients, but they 10x. So they end up with 30x the revenue that they would have ended up with before. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by haste being the killer of speed, because they're confusing scale with real sustainable growth. And you have to have the right things in place. So the organization needs to have the CS in place to be able to cope with the growth in sales. So you've got to recruit that ahead of time, but you've got to plan that beforehand. And this is why salespeople come unstuck, because you sold something and then the business can't fulfill. So now you have egg on your face. Should you that's have sold well. it to? Yeah, well, that, again, that's a different problem, isn't it? Slightly where you see this a lot, where salespeople do what's required to get it over the line. And mm -hmm. the people 
by one example, software engineers in the back have to build the damn thing are going, are you crazy? That last concession, you just wiped out half our margin because they don't know how it actually breaks down in the real cost structure. They don't know how many developer hours such a thing is. So let, let me show you the idiocy in practice with mm. actual real life uh, practical numbers. OK, and this is taken from live data. OK. Um, any marketing organization would probably be happy with a 3% click through rate and a 15% conversion rate. When you translate that into how, because the job to be done in my mind when I spend money on advertising is to convert it into revenue. Right. It failed to deliver revenue 99.9955% of the time and only delivered revenue 0.0045% of the time on that basis. Right. I then throw all of those non-unclosed -cl leads over to sales, many of whom should probably never have been attracted in the first place than the anti-ICP. And each of those, on average at the moment, requires about six to 11 follow-ups for an inbound just for you to be able to engage with them. Now, on average, it's taking around 14 effective touches to secure one meeting. And on average, what I see is seven out of eight first meetings do not result in a second. Now, what is the answer that most marketing and most investors and most boards come up with uh, in order to solve the problem that we're not generating revenue? Pour more shit in at the top. Exactly. Now, you've created a problem here because not only have you passed on these shit leads that sales has to follow up, but because they're chasing their tail, they don't have any time to build long-term, medium-term pipeline or relationships and build trust, intimacy, credibility, or reliability. They're always a quick fondle behind the bike sheds. Thank you very much, madam, and off I go. Um, and then they're moving around to the next one and the next one and the next one. So they're, you know, they're, they're just selling themselves, uh, spreading themselves too thin. Then once they've closed any deal they can, because they've got a quota to meet, Right. They chuck those over the wall to CS who've got a bunch of people who are unsuitable, been missold, have wrong expectations and become churn risks automatically. Yeah. And it's not unheard of to have a 15% churn rate. Well, 15% churn means every three years you have to replace 49% of your customers. And after that ball ache, are you serious? So, what we should be doing is asking a better question right at the front end, which is, what is the job that unifies us all, that serves the customer, so we create products and services that don't come back for customers who do, and then bring their wealthy friends? That's the you question. Make it, I want you to make ask. it sound simple, but a lot of these things do come down. They start with fairly simple principles, and then... They can grow to greater complexities after that, but don't start with complexity. That's one of the things I love about your your philosophy and your attitude there. And another thing just to point out to the listeners that might be tuned into this, I love that piece that you mentioned about flipping it into the negative. It's something so few people do. They write, you know, how do we get there? And they do maybe a bit of project planning or whatever and contingency planning, but they rarely actually flip it into if they have a to-do list, have a not to-do list. Yes, and, a, a don't list. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. In psychology, they call it inversion technique. It's where you flip it. Ah. And it's like a photograph. You look at the negative, other yeah. things become apparent. It's a very useful tool. So you're, you're absolutely spot well, on. The universe is 94% dark matter, isn't it? So, We've got so no idea say. what that is. Exactly. It's just, it, yeah. They don't know what it is, so they go, oh, it's dark matter. <laughs> but, but it's the same thing for us. It's the unknowns. Think about this. If you stop thinking in the sort of classic way that most traditional sellers think, and instead of thinking about selling cold, direct new business, you think about what is it that we can do in order to maximize revenue with minimum effort, maximize profit, and deliver the most amount of value? That's a difficult question. It's a, it's a, it requires a lot of thought. But it starts with speaking to your customer. Right. Where is your customer? What does their journey look like? What are their struggling moments along that journey where we can represent real value and show up or preempt it? 
highlight the red flags, give them the trigger warnings and say, beware of this. So when it happens, who the hell do they call? Oh, well, it's us. Why? Because we're the only one who put the time and the investment and effort into making sure that we looked after them. Because trust comes from credibility, reliability, and intimacy over self-orientation. And a risk is generated in the mind of the buyer through uncertainty and vulnerability. Exactly. We only have, sorry to uh, cut over you, we no, only no. have control over the level of uncertainty we can generate with the customer or the buyer's mind. And in order to remove their level of vulnerability, we have to be vulnerable first. If we can remove risk associated with us as the seller, then they will want us beside us, beside them on the buying journey. Now, the hard part for us is to know when to bug out because they will want us on their journey if we've done our job right, whether they're going to buy from us or not. Now, sometimes, often, in fact, it behooves us to recognize that now is not the time to make a transaction happen, but still keep the touches going and keep the relationship going because they have an ecosystem. Now we start to think organically. Well, mm -hmm. you think about the joint ventures, the channel partners, the affiliates, the associates, the alumni, the customer's customer, the family tree, and all of a sudden, one account becomes an, a, an, a career. Of course. That's and because it, of the, the basis in trust. Yes. Because they actually dare I say it, might even like you. At least they respect you in that basic way. And the key thing is I always say to my clients, it's the same stuff. It's they need to feel that you get them to a certain level. And weirdly, it's just by comparison to the other people who are having similar conversations with them or aren't their conversations aren't similar at all. And the bar is so low. It's really very low in a lot of oh, industries. My word. Exactly. So you don't even need to do that much, you know, in relative terms. I, I teach my clients the Jimmy Carr rule. I'm not going to uh, give the full version of it, but he <laughs> says that if you meet three horrible people by 12 o'clock, you're the horrible person. Okay. Okay. It's um, so he uses um, <laughs> um, more colourful uh, language, gotcha. which my wife tells yeah. me off for. Um, so um, the reality is just turn up and be a decent human being. Care genuinely give a damn um, and put their interest before your short-term selfish self-interest. If your boss is telling you, oh, you know, we need this deal in, so what? Why should your lack of preparation and lack of prospecting 12 months ago be paid for by your customer, by prematurely okay. coercing them into a decision? And incidentally, for anyone who thinks putting your customer under pressure at the end of the quarter to make a deal happen. Let me tell you what goes on in their brain. You trigger the disgust and contempt response in the insular succumbents. Go and have a look. Go and look it up, okay? Because if you want to battle against three billion years of evolutionary hardwiring, go ahead. You ain't gonna win. Absolutely. And this is the point. You've just burnt that bridge because they were going, we're moving along at a nice pace. Again, you can parallel it to another relationship, you know, moving along at a nice pace. You suddenly, oh, sudden pressure. Oh, sorry. You know, it's now or never. Yes or no. It's like, whoa. Well, I'm this, again, this again is a question that leaders and managers really need to be asking themselves. Hmm. Why are we prospecting a short term uh, pipeline? It's insane. The, certainly, if you're selling enterprise or anything remotely important, the decision began months or years before. Um, and I would urge everyone who's listening to listen to Bob Mester's uh, mattress interview on the hashtag JTDB, uh, BD, sorry, podcast, Jobs to be Done. Um, and it comes in two parts. And he interviews a man who bought a mattress that looked like a spontaneous purchase at the exit of Costco. The journey began four years before. And if you're in marketing and you're listening to this, or you're an owner and you're listening to this, and you're developing product that you think is whiz-bang, make 
bloody certain you listen to those interviews because it will open your eyes. The second thing you need to learn about is systems thinking and theory of constraint. If you don't learn about these things as salespeople, as founders, as practice owners, you're in deep trouble because the economy you are going into is if you think it's been hard of late, let me just set the scene. It is now the 31st of August, 2023. We are going into an election year next year in both the UK and America. Imagine the joy the bad actors are going to have fermenting civil dissent. Okay. There is a high level of uncertainty at the moment. We have interest rates. I'm getting 6.17% on my savings because I'm old. Um, Interest rates, inflation. Inflation is wiping out the interest that I am earning to make it worth less than nothing, depressingly. So imagine if you're paying interest, how much you're losing. Okay? There is a war for talent. There is a massive disparity as the generational shift occurs, and it looks like we are probably already in World War III. Yay! You think things... Optimistic stuff there. Well, I'm a pragmatist. Sure. That is, I cannot control any of that stuff. So where's the opportunity there? There we go. Yeah, you can choose the response. I can control my response. Exactly. And I can surround myself with an ecosystem of like-minded shared values we have diversity in everything apart from shared values okay and what our objective is to create resilience a closed or a circular economy where we end up creating business for one another because when i solve a problem it creates a problem you can solve Mm -hmm. and then i can refer you and we create this environment so we ally we create an alliance with our customer because we are helping them execute the job to be done. We're not trying to peddle them a product. And I always have a reason to talk to them, whether I have something to sell them personally or not. Because I have a duty of care. Uh, That's the key term, isn't it? It also can be called a fiduciary responsibility by the old professions. But it's that duty of care that's the difference. There's one, just to parallel that, I always remember this was summed up We're talking about actually caring, (laughs) more so having the client or the counterpart feel cared for is maybe the better way to say it. And malpractice for doctors in the United States, a lot of studies done on it. What's the difference with the same errors, right? Whatever those errors might be, the difference whether it was a lawsuit or not, malpractice suit or not, was whether literally down to how much time the doctor spent beforehand with the patient, how much the patient see, literally thought, felt cared for by that doctor. It goes even deeper because the study then went to look at oh, the medical the... students <laughs> um, and their bedside manner. And from the, from the moment they uh, first apply for a premium, that has been defined for life on the basis of their ability to be a human being. Wow. And create real empathy. Mark Goulston, one of my mentors, who wrote a fantastic book called Just Listen, and also another book called Talking to Crazy, which is mainly about talking to yourself. Gotcha. Um, and he says that all human beings crave this. They want to be heard, to feel felt, and to be understood. Now, hearing, listening is the transfer of emotion, not just meaning and understanding. And that is a rare skill. And that's the other thing that I spend a vast amount of my time helping my clients to learn. It's hard. It's the foundational piece or pieces, isn't it? You know, it's one of those foundational blocks that if you get that right, then it's not about the script. You know, this is the same thing. People are are looking at too too high a level of problem half the time. As you said, the problems are deeper. They're more foundational. Yeah. Uh, the classic one, what do I say when they use this objection or that objection? It's not about what you say. It's not saying the line. It's the relationship you built in the first place. So that if you can't, if you're, if you're trying to explain or trying to find that need, then as you said, it's not as critical a question, the same question coming from three different types of people. All right. This is well, sorry, just to build on that, the questions are key. 
And the mm -hmm. most important thing you can do, and AI is a great uh, opportunity to get uh, objective feedback on the quality of your questions, because if you get shit answers back, uh, mm -hmm. or you sound bland and mundane like everybody else, uh, then you're not asking the right question. And the key is, if you want better answers, ask better questions and start with the questions you ask yourself. What is it I want my career to give me in life? What is it I want my business to give me in life? Am I living my values or am I having to be someone I am not? You have an opportunity to today to be able to make that choice. And at the moment, you're making another choice. Is it deliberate? Well, I think you have an opportunity to take control of the few elements that are within your intrinsic control. The stuff that's extrinsic and worrying about what other people think and worrying about um, how you're seen and all this other rubbish, whether you're on top of a leaderboard. Does that really matter? Is that sustainable? I doubt it. Mm. What are the questions you're going to be asking yourself on your deathbed? Could I have spent more time at work? I doubt that too. Did I leave behind a legacy? Have I done something useful with my life? Did I make a net contribution? Well, I think these are things that people genuinely care about, and that's what engages them, and that's what brings people to brands. If the brand lives those values, it's and it's the leader, the founder, it's the practice, you know, whoever the manager is that determines the culture. Usually. As you said, that's that's that element of trust yeah. that a brand has somehow managed to get across to their customer base. Yeah, that's why, as you said, when a great brand can sell all sorts of different products and people buy into it, because it's more than just oh, you're an X company or a Y company. It's it's a whole attitude. It's a whole approach. Absolutely, well, look, it's a whole look, identity. Look at the cues. Look at the queues that were formed, um, you know, outside an Apple store, um, exactly. and people. So, uh, you know, you interview people. Oh, I'm not sure what it is, but it's Apple. Yeah, so I mean, I'll buy it. Make you for four days. It's amazing. Wow. But this is the thing. How, like, how much? It, you th it, that's the very thing. Apple just do marketing. They don't really need to do sales. People just walk in, and sales is just buy here. Click the buy button half the time. You know. Yeah. To a certain but, well, extent. Well, it, it is in their case. But sales is just a subset of marketing. Um, it, it, it's a more personal, um, you know, it, 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 and it used to be face to face, but now it's you know, over video or phone or whatever anyway. Um, but the, the medium has changed. The channel hasn't. The channel is the mind of the buyer. That's all. And as long as you can tap into that and the conversations they're already having and understand the context in which they operate, you're already ahead of the curve. But you've got to make that time for yourself, and you can't make that time if you're rushing around chasing a list of 2,000 names, trying to dial every one of them to convince all of them to buy your shit. Find the 11. Phenomenal insights there, Marcus. This is a huge amount that we've just touched on, but I love the way you brought it back to start with yourself. Start with the reflection, start with yourself. Notice those, as he said, get improve your questions because your questions have a presupposition, subconscious or very overt presupposition. Watch what they are. Uh, this is huge stuff. And as you said, we're building from those bases, from those foundations up. But you need the solid foundations to start with. What, one of my favorite things at the moment is to use the AI to deconstruct my conversations and to critique me. Um, <laughs> and it's excruciatingly painful. I mean, I'm 35 years into this. I should know better. Um, and um, what's fabulous is it's brutal and my ego cannot possibly complain because I asked for it. And it's just giving me objectively back what I asked it. So if the question is bad, that's on me. If the answer is what I wanted, I then have to examine uh, where are my biases in this? Uh, what are my preconceptions? Um, what are my uh, uh, hopes and fears? You know, what, what baggage am I bringing to this party that's causing this to fail? I've improved so much as a result of having this thing beat me to death on a daily basis. 
<laughs> it sounds like we'd have a whole conversation on how to use ChatGPT or other AIs in a very effective way, because so many people seem to be using it in a very thin way, oh. in, in very unhelpful ways, just churning out crap. But as you said, it's such a powerful tool when, when used in an effective manner. And again, it's mixing and matching because they've mm. got different language models. Um, and um, I mean, I developed a prompt. It took about um, 20 minutes to eventually get down to it. Um, but it was worth it because now whenever I want research, I just move the stuff from the square brackets and change that. And then I press click and off it goes. And it comes back with a dozen bits of really good quality research, which I can then go and validate. Um, but you do that on BARD. You don't do it on GPT. Um, right. Because I want the up-to-date research up to 23, not 21. Right. Right. Okay. Then I apply what I find in there on GPT, on Llama. And all of a sudden, I'm getting these very different perspectives. And I can layer questions. For example, I can layer a mom-style question in order to get an uh, unbiased response. I can have a jobs-to-be-done question. Um, I can have a solution focused therapy question and I can build all of these questions into my frameworks. It's just awesome. I, I've never, ever been able to think in this way. Phenomenal. So if anyone wants help too. on this stuff, let yeah. me know. Please, definitely. I mean, do, <laughs> I was going to ask, you know, do, do you have any resource around that that, that people can can learn more yeah, because I think um, a lot of people are just tripling, you know, tripping over themselves with the chat GPT. They're playing with it, but they're not very effective. I, I'm, I'm launching an offer on this one, but we've uh, I partnered up with my pal Moed Amin, who's a neuroscientist, and he worked at CEB um, at the time when they were developing Challenger. He was one of their sales directors and uh, then went over to Gartner. And uh, we put a program together and it was essentially a six part program on uh, how to use AI well and how to formulate great questions, then how to research your customer psychographically, um, understand uh, over time how to use public information to understand their psychology understand their current sentiment, uh, using um, analyst calls um, in order to identify uh, strategic drivers and changes in sentiment and uh, direction. Then how to research your market, how to research your competition, how to research your customer's competition, and then how to pull it all together to develop a hypothesis so that when you open up uh, the door, um, the person who refers you in, because this is the other thing that we've re realized, is people aren't picking up the phone or answering email. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn how to sell hot, not cold. So combining the research with how do you get introduced by somebody who is trusted by both sides mm -hmm. and for them to deliver your hypothesis like a, a bullet between the eyes, that's what that program is. So yeah. we have that available, but with um, a, a lot of learning came from the first two iterations. So um, I'm launching a third now. So Marcus, where can people get in touch with you? Where can they learn more about you? Uh, LinkedIn is the best place. So Marcus Kauke, C A U C H I, um, Marcus at laughs hyphen uh, Twitter, I'm the underscore inquisitor, and the, uh, the inquisitor podcast with Marcus Kauke. Those are probably the best places. Outstanding stuff. Marcus, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you.